Hi, welcome to another episode of the Happy Even After podcast. I am your host, Renee Bauer, and we have a special, some two special guests today, and I'm really excited about this conversation because I really think that this conversation that we're about to have is really goes to the heart of everything that I have really set out to do and really wanted to accomplish with this podcast. So let me introduce you to Lauren Kirk and April Kirk, and they are the co-hosts of the Parenting Past Chaos podcast, and they have an awesome blog called Wife's Tales, which I'll put all of those links in the show notes. But I want to tell you their story first before we start talking to them, because I think it's so important to understand that um, before we dive into the questions. So let me introduce them to you a little bit further and a, a little bit more personally, I should say. Lauren was a child of divorce, and April was raised by a single mom. April married young and had two daughters, and Lauren, at 21, entered into a relationship with someone who was already attached, and she married him, but it didn't last. April was in a toxic first marriage, and then one week after she got divorced, she got remarried to a man that wasn't quite a right fit either, and she divorced again. So Lauren and her husband, now with three kids, knew their relationship was coming to an end, so they started their divorce. And then something happened that rocked everyone's world. April's husband and Lauren started a relationship. So other way around. Okay. Lauren's husband and April started a, let me just, uh, let me just re, I'll record that and then edit that out. So Lauren's husband, Lauren's husband, yes, that's right, because I knew that. (laughs) I just wrote it wrong. All right. And then something that rocked their world happened. Lauren's husband and April started a relationship. And one more thing, they're neighbors. So they endured endless conflict in days in court for a really long time. And you would think that it was hopeless. But was it? Because today they sit here as guests on my podcast, but they're also neighbors, co-hosts on their own podcast, and co-writers on their blog, and get this one, best friends. So welcome, guys. Thank you Thank so you. much. We're going to cry <laughs> with just... that intro. I'm going to cry. I don't know what's wrong with Well, me. so I have to be honest with you. As I was preparing for this interview, I like did a really deep dive into your blog and your writing is so beautiful. And through your words, honestly, like I was getting choked up because there was so much rawness and emotion and it like, it really just like really was just it gave me all the feels and made me tear up too so you guys are not alone because i just read that and i was like wow like you know it's so easy for someone to judge and someone to be on the outside and to have opinions and talk and gossip and all of that but the reality of it is no one knows what's happening better than the people who are living it and you know it, it's that everything that someone feels through their divorce and the shame and the guilt and all of that, that really like weighs on you, well, there's people behind that. And like, you guys are the people in the story. So I like, I don't even know where to begin because there's so much I want to talk about. So, um, I, you know, I guess let's start where I don't want to go into the the history and the, the how that happened because that's history that's water under the bridge but let's start at the point where you guys said like enough is enough and how did that happen how did you go from like such high conflict to now like you guys are legitimately best friends <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so we actually had several ebbs and flows over the course of our relationship and just knowing each other. Um, I would say the custody battle being the most tumultuous part, obviously. And then it started to kind of die down. You know, we started to um, slow down the court process. We were both getting drained and tired of it all. Um, and I was going through, I had been single for quite some time, but I was going through a really bad breakup and I just knew I needed help. And for whatever reason, the one person I wanted to try to reach out and see if I could just make a connection with was April. And she answered the phone and 
we just kind of met as two women and let bygones be bygones and slowly thought, well, we can make this simple at least. I like you. You like me. We know each other. And somewhere along the road, we kind of just fell in love. (laughs) (laughs) That's hysterical. (laughs) So you don't need the husband then. (laughs) (laughs) He might not last, but the friendship will. (laughs) You have no (laughs) idea how true that is. Oh, that's so funny. So April, you say something on your website and I'm going to quote you on it because I want you to talk about it. You say, it is not to say that I wanted all the chaos that life handed me, but choices were made and consequences were handed out. What consequences were those and how do you reconcile that? I think my consequences and chaos started at a very young age and just flowed into my adulthood. But I think at that point, I was talking about this relationship. You can't always choose who you fall in love with. And the embarrassment of being divorced twice was something that I never, ever thought I would ever have to deal with. And once it was happening and it, it became my right, my reality, I was even more devastated. I was disappointed in myself, but I didn't want to let that after everything else that I had overcome in my life, I didn't want to let that be the defining thing that just sent me over the edge. I knew what I was getting into and I fell in love with John and it wasn't a fairy tale, unfortunately for us, for our love it was, but for the relationship and everything that was going on behind the scenes, it was not, it was not good at all. And so in that chaos, the consequences of, I just felt, I don't know, because I think you relate to this, Lauren. I think that you fall in love with someone and even though you know that it's amazing, you almost feel like your punishment for your third marriage is having to deal with all of this chaos that we've created. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think there's something about that stigma of being married multiple times and you try to hide it. Um, And I think for April, she just decided, you know what? No more. I'm going to be proud. I, er- I earned this love in my life. I've dealt with the battles. I've dealt with the consequences of sometimes other people's, re- you know, actions. So she deserves this piece of perfection as she called it. She's not going to settle for anything less and just own it girl. Right. Right. And I think that that's so hard to do. So you, you know, and I, I'm the same way. We talked about this before that I'm divorced twice too. And there's like, I'm a divorce lawyer. So I'm in this space and I had so much shame. And, you know, if I am feeling that and I can like have a rational, let my brain sort of process it, but I'm still feeling those emotions. How does someone else feel it? Who's not always in this space. And, you know, and that's the part that's so heartbreaking is the people who are out there who feel that or feel like they're less than because they have a second marriage that didn't work out or even a third or what, whatever it is, you know? So is that the inspiration for what you're doing now? Absolutely. That and just everything, because when Lauren and I started talking and becoming friends, we realized that we had so much in common as women from our childhoods even, and we had very difficult lives, but we noticed that the one thing that we never let happen is we never let that defeat us or define us actually. So we wanted to empower other women to say, you know what, here's the way that I am. I don't like for anyone to know any of my downfalls or I always want to paint this perfect picture of myself. And that puts so much pressure on you as a woman, as a person in general. So Lauren and I wanted to make sure that we told everybody it's okay. You're human. You don't have to be perfect. You can be married 10 times, hopefully not, but you can, (laughs) and that's okay. Own it. And here's our story. And it's not amazing and it's not great and it's not beautiful all the time, but it's ours and we love it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the foundation of this entire thing is we went through divorces, but our children, didn't divorce from their parents. We wanted to still give them the family setting and they very much have that. That's not something that I'm ashamed of. I'm not giving my child less because I, you know, divorced their father. There's no less love. In fact, there's more of it and there's probably more chaos too, but we (laughs) navigate that as best as we can. So let's talk about that because you have six between the two of you. Yes. Yes. Okay. So what are the ages? I have a daughter that will be 24 in November 
and a daughter that just turned 21 last week. And she has a son that's two years old. Oh and my then gosh. I have also a son that will be 14 in November. And then uh, John and I together, or also April, we have a Jackson who will be uh, 10 in November. We have a middle one who will be eight coming up soon. And then we have a brand new five-year-old. And how do, what does co-parenting look like? I mean, how far apart do you guys live? You're on the same street, right? Same yes, we live, we live eight houses apart. Okay. <laughs> Which is super convenient if someone forgets <laughs> yes. like something at someone else's house. <laughs> super easy. Yeah. Our co-parenting situation now is really cool. We do week on and week off. So we do a Sunday exchanges where we, you know, let the kids run to the next parent's house. But um, we see each other every day. The kids kind of have a free reign to walk or ride their bikes between parents or have dinner at anyone's house. Um, April has uh, her first husband's live in the neighborhood too. So our kids all oh, kind no. of congregate to everyone's home. There's, I guess, what, four homes? Yes. Am I saying that right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's amazing. I mean, what you're doing though, is what the courts actually want parents to be able to figure out on their own. They don't want to tell other people how to parent or co-parent. So I think that it's incredible. But now the question is, how long did it take you to get to the point where you are? Because I know that your situation was, was really high conflict. So it was not this smooth sailing mediation and like everyone's happy. Like you guys were on, went on a roller coaster, especially yeah. you Lauren, right? Yes. Um, I would say total, uh, probably three years yes. or just coming up on three years, um, or three years that would have been that we, we spent in custody and, and back and forth. Um, but we've been doing this co-parenting dynamic now for what would you say? Um, a little over a year and a half. Yes. Okay. That's right. And so how do you deal with any disagreements about co-parenting? Cause I'm sure it happens. It's only natural. I think now we really have such a great communication between at least Lauren and I. Yeah. <laughs> um, that anything that happens, we kind of nip it in the bud before it even gets to a point where it's going to cause any kind of conflict for us. Yeah, we're the main moms in this. So she and I do most all of the co-parenting together. And then we just kind of delegate to the fathers, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> That's why things are so smooth. <laughs> yeah, women run the world. We do. So, okay. So how did your ex-husband, Lauren, slash husband, April, um, really sw swallow, I guess is the right word? Or like, h how did he deal with having his new wife and ex-wife be friends? Because that's probably terrifying to him. <laughs> a little bit. Go ahead. At first, <laughs> it was a absolutely not. And then he remembered who he was married to. And I don't take no for an answer. So that was short-lived. But we did. I mean, I knew that it was going to be difficult. But I think John understood that we were doing it for the greater good. And you asked Lauren, the very first question is, how do you get to this point? Well, after $28,000 in legal fees, you get to that point really easily, really quick. And I didn't give up. I, you know, I kept going at, I say going at Lauren and I don't mean that in a physical <laughs> way. I mean, I just kept going at her as far as, Hey, let's try to figure this out. And when you're inserting yourself as the new wife into a marriage that or a divorce that was volatile and a marriage that wasn't always the greatest. You're not really received very well, but I never let that get to me. I just kept going. I'm like, you know, one day she's going to love me and I'm just going to keep at it. And I did. You cracked me eventually yeah, because, you know, for so long I was trying to crack my ex-husband, you know, my other co-parents, I was trying to make it like figure out how we were going to do this and it wasn't working and it wasn't working. And so you just have to try for the, you know, 15th time, keep trying and, and, Becoming friends with April and, and opening up communication with her, that was that 15th try. And it just clicked. It was like, this, this is what works for us. Yeah. So John knew that we were doing this for the greater good, meaning our children, obviously. We want to make sure that although they're coming from a broken home, they don't have to come from a broken family. Like We can right. all get together and raise our children and show them that we still are a unit and we can love them in spite of not being in love with their parents any longer. Right? And maybe we have to start talking about our, a blended family in a different way. Like that word broken is so negative. Like yes. we need to flip it. Like how about a redefined home, a reconfigured home? It's not broken. 
you know? And I think that's the stigma that gets attached, which leads to the guilt and the shame and, and all of that. We say this all the time that society wants or has led us to believe that we're supposed to be mortal enemies, that we're supposed to not get along and we're supposed to be separated. Okay. You're divorced. That's separate enough. That doesn't mean that you don't, that you're not allowed to be in your children's lives 24 seven. That's the hardest part I think about going through the custody is you're deciding on who gets this time with your children. Well, why does it have to be a decision that's made? Why can't you just all come together and say, we're going to share our children. We both created them. So let's get together and raise them together. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that um, the term broken home would be if some of, if some of us had stayed married and, and kept our children in the homes with our spouses and our marriages, my children then would have come from a broken home because it was a volatile situation. So now they're coming from happy homes. Mm -hmm. It's just an addition. Right. Um, I, I want to ask you guys each a question um, that is often something that people, when they come to me, they ask. And um, I think it's so important for listeners to hear it from other people who have gone through it, but it's the, how do you know, you know, that point when you say, how do I know that this relationship isn't serving me where this marriage isn't going to work anymore and being able to walk away from that because you both did that. And clearly it was for the better of your life, your relationships and, but not everyone does that. And so many people get stuck and they think they have to hold on, especially if they're in a second marriage or a third. And they're like, well, it's so embarrassing if I leave again, so I'll just stay. So how did, how did you each go through that process of knowing? So mine was probably a little bit different than hers, but my husband and I had, you know, issues very early on, um, with different things and infidelity and whatnot. And so for me, it was always kind of, we were kind of putting band-aids on everything and we were doing everything that you're supposed to do to make your marriage work, quote unquote, mm -hmm. and it wasn't getting better. And so you eventually get to this place where, okay, um, daddy's sleeping in a different room or we're raising our voices now. This is no longer healthy. And when you can both come together and look at each other and honestly say that, okay, now it's time to like, maybe we'll actually be better parents and better people in two different homes. And that very much happened to be the case for us. And as I said before, I am a perfectionist and I don't want to admit that I can't do something, but my first marriage was something that should have never happened to begin with. So it was, I think while it was hard, it was easy at the same time, if that makes sense to walk away. Mm -hmm. But the second one wasn't because it wasn't, a situation where we had a volatile marriage, but I'd lost myself somewhere in there. And I fought for 15 years to make sure that I wasn't another divorcee. And I just realized, you know what, my happiness means more than what anybody else thinks about me or how anybody else feels. If I can't wake up every single day and want to actually live my best life, then this isn't the place for me. Mm, yeah, that's powerful stuff. And I think it's a good point because so often when someone gets divorced, they're thinking the other person is awful. They're an awful human. They're, you know, you, you villainize them. And, but, but really what you're saying is, uh, Lauren, you're saying like, this wasn't a good fit. He can still be a good dad and it wasn't a good fit for the two of you, but he's going to be a good fit for somebody because clearly he was. And, Absolutely. you know, and I think that's so important to recognize, like you're just because a relationship is broken doesn't mean that person is a horrible human being. And just understanding that not all people are good for everyone. You know, you I think shouldn't, you shouldn't take it personally that someone yeah. is not their best version with you. Mm -hmm. you know, he's going to be his best version with her. I don't need to take it personally. It has nothing to do with me. I'm just not that person for him. Right, right. And it probably makes co-parenting easier when that person is being their best version with somebody else. Absolutely. Absolutely. I remember Lauren saying this all the time that things will get so much better once John's happier. And mm -hmm. I think it has, and it's taken a lot longer than we wanted it to for him, but everybody heals <laughs> at different rates, you know, and you can't put a, a time frame on anybody else's ability to get over something. And I think that's what's happened in our situation a lot of the times. Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So you have a disclaimer on your website um, that I think is kind of your mission statement, whether you intended it to be or not. And I want to read it just because I think it goes straight to the heart of the work that you're doing and why you're doing it. So you say, we are not doctors, lawyers, licensed therapists, or professionals of any kind. This is just our story, how we work together to get through our hardships and raise our children in a loving and supportive environment. We are just two women who've been living our own personal hell for far too long that we decide to take our situation and turn it into something good. What we write, the advice we give is not intended to be the answer to all of your problems. This is just our handbook on how we are navigating through this crazy thing called life. So are you guys getting emotional on me again? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's it. That sums it up. That's the powerful stuff. And that's why like I was getting emotional going through it because you guys have done something incredible here. And like, that's what I want my listeners to really connect with that no matter where they are or how much they hate their, their soon to be X or, or X right now, or, or how much they, you know, despise the new girlfriend or boyfriend there, there can be a different way, but it's going to require work and for them to make choices. It's going to require you to be a little bit open-minded. Um, I don't think think I ever would have thought I'd be sitting next to this woman as my best friend, uh, but I am. And I'm very honored and proud of that because we have a lot to be proud for. We, we both worked and, and done so much to get to this place. Lauren and I often say that we wish we could go back almost and relive some of the things that we went through because it's so hard to believe that we would hang over the fences and yell and scream <laughs> profanities at the top of our lungs to each other at one time. And now we are, we are in love with each other as women. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't think that we give ourselves as much credit as we deserve because we have done something really phenomenal and fantastic. And we have forgiven ourselves. We've forgiven each other. We've forgiven people that don't even deserve to be forgiven to get to where we are right now. And I'm just so proud of us. That's and what makes me emotional. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think some of the best friendships um, and the strongest are those that can come from enemies because you've seen the good and the bad and the ugly of this person and they've done the same for you. And now you're still standing here supporting me and loving me. And I have so much more love and support for her. Mm -hmm. So aside from yelling at each other across the <laughs> fence, what is something else that you would have done differently? in your, in the divorce or in the whole situation? Um, I think for me, I would have tried to be more op open-minded early on with communicating with April, because I think if I had done that before we got to the really extensive portions with our attorneys, I don't think, um, the attorneys, I, I think we could have slowed stuff down and, and put a halt to it, but because no one was communicating at all. She had no idea where I was coming from. My ex-husband had no idea where I was coming from. We were both on two different battlegrounds. Um, I wish that I would have communicated less with him and tried harder with her. Mm. I think that I, if I could go back and do it again or do something differently, I've always prided myself in making my own opinions about people. But in the midst of hurt and anger and things being said, that you wish had never been said, you develop this emotion that you're just, it's almost like get even. And I wish that we wouldn't have got, had gotten to that place that we felt like we needed to get even. And I wish I'd been more of an advocate for Lauren earlier on mm -hmm. than almost, and I didn't fuel the fire by, by saying something or provoking anything, but I feel like I fueled it by not doing more, if that makes any sense. That does make sense. So, I mean, you're, what you're doing is it sounds like you're going back and saying, I should have been a greater support to the soon to be X. And like, that is crazy, Yeah, <laughs> you know, but know. no, know. but it's, but it's so powerful. And like, you think about how, how could other people divorce has been different if they did that or if they took that approach like it's yes because it's hard as a new mm -hmm. wife because you love your husband I do love my husband I love him I loved him then I love him now but it's hard to watch him be hurt but then at the same time I'm a woman and I love you know I have love for this woman because how can I not I love her children 
they are a part of my husband and I can't hate them and hate her. I mean, it's just not possible. I have to love them. I have to love her. And same goes for you as being the stepmom and the, and the nurturer for my children when they're with their father, I should have been more supportive, um, for his new love and her new love. Mm. I, I would want to fall in love. I would want ha- my happily ever after. It wasn't with him and that's okay. I wasn't sad that I didn't have him. I wasn't jealous. I just should have been um, a bigger supporter, I think, of their love story early on. But that's hard. Like, I think it, that's it asking a lot for, for anyone. Yes, it is. It is. But it's something that over the, over the years and over time, I have... I love, it's the most beautiful thing. In fact, it's been a great example for our children and for myself and, and a standard for which I want to set my love story. Hmm. So do you think that the court process and the lawyer's involvement and judge's involvement and all of that actually made things worse for you when you were going? 100%. Yeah. We can answer that one the same. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, there were times, and especially towards the end, and I think I talked about this before, that I came to Lauren and said, hey, you know what? We're going to write our own custody agreement. We're going to do this by ourselves because when John and I, there were so many times that we had sat outside and cried and prayed and said, you know, we got to do something different. We can't live this life anymore like this. It's taking a toll on now our relationship, and it hadn't before. It had just taken a toll on our finances and our sanity, but now it's it's getting very much into our relationship and we don't want that. So we would go to the attorneys on, on, I know three different occasions to say, you know what, I think we're done with this and we really want to try to come to some mutual agreement. Oh, and we were discouraged from that every time. That's so sad. It's, you know, it's such a disservice to what that, what family lawyers are supposed to be doing. So and as the, the woman on the other side of this courtroom, I will say that the things that I now know they were tasked to do or their attorney was tasking to do against me, I, I don't know how sh- that person sleeps at night. Well, and, and really because it's to, you're, you do everything to set up to win. Yes, so how are you was. going to win that fight? And so what ammunition are you going to get and how are you going to use it? And what's your aim going to be? And are you going to hit the mark? And that has lasting damaging effects to a co-parent, co-parenting relationship. It has it to the children. Yeah, I and, think that we definitely dealt with that. Absolutely. I think that that's something that every person that's going through this situation right now should think about. Is it really worth any of that? At the, at the end of the day, is it worth your children's emotional well-being and they're not a, a pro a, a, an object to be one that's so sick for someone to sit up and try to tell you how to raise your children or where they should be and when they should be there it's embarrassing as parents you're entrusted with the lives of your children you make that decision and make it the best way that you can and how are your children uh doing with all of this and how, you know, your podcast is co-parenting past chaos. So I'm sure there's a ton of laundry and a ton of like empty wrappers in like (laughs) in the, in the snack drawer, but the chaos really is that everyday chaos, but how is their lives in terms of the chaos of what their parenting, you know, what their relationship with their parents and step parent and, and all of that. Our children have normal children chaos. They don't have the worries and stresses of a chaotic co-parenting world. Um, They have organized, we have structure and routine weekly for them. And I think from household to household, we keep it mirrored. They have multiple parents that love them and they get to see and communicate with and everyone does their best. It's all hands on deck at all times. I think our children are flourishing. They're doing better than they ever have before. There's no anxiety that, that there was in the very beginning of who do I like and who do I get to talk to and who do I get to run to? Our kids run to us all. And that's Mm -hmm. amazing. And we just, we're such a good competition amongst the parents. That's amazing because they are allowed to love everyone and not feel like they have to decide or be tugged or pull. It's like that, you know, you see those pictures of the kids' arms outstretched and one parent tugging and you're giving your kids the gift of never having to know that. So that's amazing. 
All right, ladies. So we are wrapping up. Um, I have a final question for you, but before we do, how do my listeners find you, reach out, follow you? Um, because everyone should be, because you guys really have the best social media <laughs> that's out there. Your pictures are killer. Every time Thank I see you. another one, I'm like, oh, they did it again. You guys look <laughs> so good. <laughs> it's awesome. All right. So you can find us at Co-Parenting Past Chaos on pretty much every platform. We're actually on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all as at Co-Parenting Past Chaos. And then our blog is Wife's Tales. Um, so it's W-I-F-E-S-T-A-L-E-S.com. And that's where all of our stories and our blogs go for every week, every Friday, we post a new one. And it's definitely worth the read. So my final question is, what do you say to that person who is really in the middle of a chaotic situation right now? Maybe their divorce is pending. Um, they're stuck. There's so much conflict. What's the one piece of advice you can give them at this moment as to what they should be doing right now? They should love their children more than they hate their ex. That's the best advice. You stole it from me. I should have answered first. <laughs> um, I would say take a deep breath, focus on yourself and focus on your children and try looking at your situation from another perspective for the first time. And it might just change the entire game. Here's something that Lauren says all the time is that you can't get this time back with your children, it's precious. And you don't want them to remember you in a fight with their father constantly or their mother constantly. You want to create precious memories that they're going to look back on and enjoy. You're wasting your own time, but more importantly, you're, you're wasting your child's youth. You're yeah. wasting those precious, innocent moments that you, you guys can't get back. It's all great advice. You guys are so inspirational and really what your, your story is a gift for someone who feels like they would never be able to do that because they, they are, they have feelings. There's, you know, there's fault in the relationship and all of that. You're saying you're showing that you actually can do all of that. And the result is worth the effort. So Absolutely. thank you so much thank for you. coming you. on and uh, I'll put all of the show notes in the, um, all of the links in the show notes. And so everyone can connect uh, with Lauren in April. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you.